right. Well, I think we'll just go ahead and get started. It's, the, uh, it's that time. So I'd like to welcome everybody to the webinar today. There'll be more joining us here, I'm sure, as uh, we move forward. But I really want to thank Michael Rush for being here as our guest speaker today. Uh, I became familiar with Michael's works a couple of years ago and have really enjoyed uh, two of his books that I've read and look forward to the others. Um, Michael was uh, born and raised in the Western United States along the Wasatch Mountain. So I assume that was Utah, Michael. Um, I, well, I've lived in Utah. I grew up in California, uh, Pismo Beach area, Royal Grande. Um, I, my first job out of college was in San Francisco. Um, lived in Walnut Creek, uh, Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh in California, not oh, you know, Pittsburgh, I, Pennsylvania. I'm from Pennsylvania, um, so I hear me. <laughs> lived in Modesto, um, uh, California. So yeah, then I, you know, I lived in, I've lived in North Ogden um, as a, you know, as a young kid. Uh, I, I left, I lived in Centerville, uh, Utah, um, and Franklin, Tennessee. Um, you know, that's, that's probably the favorite place I've ever lived, you know. Tennessee is just an awesome place. I've never been there. So, uh, and, you know, uh, North Carolina, I've lived in um, every time zone in the, in the country. So, huh. so I, I assume with all the moving, you have learned to travel light and not uh, <laughs> attach to things of the world too much. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, I've got a big family, so it's amazing how much stuff you can accumulate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I dread if I ever have to move again. I just have a fire sale, literally. literally. Yeah. So, uh, well, and, and Michael's background, for those of you that don't know, he, he graduated from Brigham Young University with a degree in accounting and information systems. And while he was there, he met and married his wife, Amy. A, uh, she was from Kansas. And they began their career in San Francisco working for Ernst & Young, one of the probably big six back then, yeah. uh, whatever it is now. It's, maybe big four, three, yeah. <laughs> keep shrinking. Um, and Michael is uh, currently in North Carolina is the CFO of a venture capital group, right? Is that what you said? Uh, um, well, it's a company owned by a venture capital uh, group. The name of the company is Fiber Exfiltration. Uh, we make air filtration uh, media. So when you're changing out your uh, HVAC filters or you know, just for your, um, you know, your air filters in your house, we make the media for that. Um, someone else makes the actual filter. Gotcha. <laughs> cool. So, Michael, uh, I guess we could say your your claim to fame. Uh, one of the things that you've done is uh, the um, interpretation of and, and uh, deciphering the Ezra's Eagle prophecy out of the Apocrypha. And I don't know if you want, you know, as you're going along, maybe you want to share a little bit about what uh, kind of triggered that. I don't know if you've ever shared that story before or not, but that might be interesting to people to, you know, why were you studying in the Apocrypha? What kind of led you there? How'd, how'd that take place? Um, just something you can consider sharing. And then uh, Michael is also uh, the author of four books, um, A Remnant Shall Return, Daniel 11, a book on Revelation, The Vision of John the Divine, and Delight in Plainness, which looks at uh, the Isaiah chapters in Nephi, and brings in uh, some of the prophecies of Ezekiel. And so um, we're just really grateful to have you here today, Michael, and um, I'll let you kind of jump in. Uh, let me just, I guess, tell everybody, if you want to ask a question, uh, if you'll use the Q&A button at the bottom, I'll monitor that while we are going along. And Michael's just going to make this a very informal uh, kind of presentation. And so ask your questions there. You can chat about things in the chat with people, but if you have a question for Michael, if you'd post it in the Q&A section, that way I can see it, monitor it, and uh, ask Michael that question right away. And uh, I think that is it. So with that, Michael, I'll let you get started. Yeah. Um, well, so to answer your question about you know, how I kind of got started in all of this, you know, I've always been, even from you know, a kid, just been fascinated with Israel, with the house of Israel. Um, and so I've, I've been studying that subject, you know, my whole life. I remember, you know, reading this book called Oh Jerusalem, you know, in high school and just being dumbfounded by the miracles in the modern day uh, founding of 
Israel, the Jewish nation. And yeah, it was it was clear to me that that could not have happened if not for the hand of the Lord. And what was surprising to me was you know, the fact that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints really had nothing to do with it. Um, the Lord did it. Um, and he did it in miraculous ways. Um, and as I've studied that through the course of my life, you know, I've, you know, looked to any and every source, you know, I've always been fascinated by, you know, ancient scriptural writings. Um, so, you know, obviously I've read, you know, the LDS canon, but, um, I've also read, you know, the Apocrypha, I've read the uh, Pseudopigrapha, I've read, you know, the Quran, I've read, um, well, you know, some of the Vedic texts. Uh, I, you know, I just like reading and looking for, you know, truth that's out there. And it's amazing. Um, some of the things that, uh, you know, I found in some of these ancient, you know, documents, I got to say, one of my favorite um, books um, are the, the books of the lost books of Adam and Eve. Um, they're just fascinating to me, uh, to read. And I, I feel something special when I read those books. So, um, a while ago I read when I was reading in the Apocrypha, I came across, you know, um, second Esdras. And that's where, you know, the prophecy that, you know, I call Esdras Eagle is, uh, is from. And the first time that I read it, <clears throat> You know, I knew that it was significant, but I had no clue what it meant. And I, I tried to figure it out at the time. I just, I just had to set it aside. Um, and, you know, it wasn't until after I had written my first book, A Remnant Shall Return, um, that in my, my first edition of that did not include uh, the chapters on Ezra Eagle. And, you know, it was... You know, one morning, you know, I was lying in bed and I just had the strongest impression that I needed to go back and read that specific part in the Apocrypha, which was strange because, you know, it'd been, it'd been years since I had read, you know, that. And I got into some of those, those writings. I had a, a class at uh, uh, BYU where the professor, um, all of the, the writings that we read for that class were ancient texts. Um, and that got me into reading ancient texts uh, to start with. And you know, I'll be you know, forever indebted to him for getting me going on that. But um, that's, that's where I was introduced to the Apocrypha uh, in the first place. And so I went back uh, and got you know, a copy of that again and, and was reading it. And as I was reading it this time, you know, it was, it was the most amazing thing to me. I mean, as, as I was reading it from the perspective of the house of Israel and all, all the things that I had studied relating to the house of Israel and the promises and covenants that the Lord has made to restore Israel in the last days, everything in that prophecy just jumped from the page at me. And, and as I was reading it, I, you know, I just started, it came alive to me. And I knew what the things meant. And not only did I know what they meant, it just, it profoundly impacted me to the point that, you know, you know I, I started shaking. I was looking around in the library, expecting other people to be feeling the same awe that I was feeling as I was going through and reading that and just being astounded at the fact that there's this prophecy that, you know, from its writings purports to be 2,600 years old, and it's laying out in intricate details, you know, the things that will take place within the United States of America. And, you know, it was amazing uh, that I, I read that back in uh, 2015. And that's, that's when I added it. I, I wrote my book around the show return in 2014. And then I added um, Ezra's Eagle to, to it in 2015. Uh, uh, and I added the last seven chapters to that book in 2018. Um, and, you know, I, 
I, again, I got to reiterate that it was my understanding of the covenants and promises that the Lord has made with the house of Israel that made all of the difference. And unless you understand the covenants that the Lord has made with the house of Israel, you simply can't understand the prophecies in the Old Testament, what, what they mean, particularly those pertaining to the events of the last days, which are going to be astounding. Um, when Christ talks about the events of the last days, I mean, he, you know, he said, you know, kings will shut their mouths for that, which, you know, they have never heard shall they see. And you know, there's, there's many prophets who were astounded and terrified by what they saw taking place in the last days. And it revolves around the covenants that the Lord has made. And, you know, so, you know, that's, that's the background. And that's what's, you know, really unlocked these things for me. Um, that's why, you know, I was able to write the book on Daniel 11, um, which, you know, is, you know, a fairly cryptic uh, chapter. You know, lots of Daniel's writings are fairly cryptic. But when you look at it from the perspective and background of the covenants and promises and prophecies pertaining to Israel and Israel's restoration, it became clear to me. And the same thing with the book of Revelation. Um, John writes in a very symbolic and uses a lot of imagery, but those symbols and the imagery that he uses all comes from, you know, the prophecies and covenants and history of Israel. And when you understand that, things that were once almost as they, you know, as if they were encrypted through symbolism become perfectly clear. And it's, it's just so exciting to me. Um, and you, once you understand it, you know, honestly, once I wrote A Remnant Shall Return, I didn't think I needed to write any of these other books because I felt, you know, it, it's redundant. Why would I need to write Daniel 11? Because once you understand this stuff, it's just clear. It's plain as day. Um, but, you know, I've, it's, it's always been you know, somewhat surprising to me. The way that, you know, A Remnant Shall Return came to pass, it, it started out as my notes. And I, I started sharing my notes. You know, it started with my wife. I said, oh, you, you've, got, you've got to listen to this. And so I'd go and I'd read her all these passages, <laughs> passages from Isaiah. And she'd go, what? Why is that cool? I don't understand. I said, what, what do you mean you don't understand? This is amazing. And so I, I started adding more and more context to it. And, you know, that's, that's really how um, my first book came to pass. I mean, it's, it started from me just explaining scriptures. And there's over 800 scriptures that I, I talk about in that one book, um, Around so, Shall Return. So let's, let's ask uh, a couple of questions here that have popped up. And also, if you, like, you, you do have like 800 scriptures in that book. It is heavily footnoted, and you've really gone to uh, links to bring those together. Um, what about the process that you use to take notes in order to write? Like, how do you, as you're researching and pulling this stuff together, what are the tools that you're using um, to, to kind of organize your thoughts and be able to, to put the, the writings together? Okay. Well, um, yeah, you know, I started out using Excel, <laughs> putting, you know, scriptures and verses. You're an accountant. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, I'm an accountant. I know Excel very well. Um, and then, you know, I, I've used many different um, things in the past. Uh, I used to get old or, you know, I'd buy a copy of the scriptures and I'd cut the verses out and I'd put them in piles, all of these, you know, verses that talked about the same thing. Um, and then I tried to organize them in Excel and then I put them into Word and organized them that way. Um, and then it evolved into a book. Um, but, you know, honestly, um, I, I have just read so many things. Um, and, you know, people are surprised sometimes. You know, they, they assume that 
I've you know read a bunch of books from other authors, and you know, you know frankly, when it comes to, uh, and this is going to to sound strange, seeing since you know I am an LDS author. Um, the uh, when I was a kid, I was fascinated with the Second Coming, and, and I read um, a book. I won't say you know the author, but I was very frustrated by the book because I could never tell when this guy, and this was a very well-respected person, um, I could never tell when what he was saying was his opinion or when it was the scriptures. And, you know, I wanted to be able to go to the scriptures and read more about it, but I could never tell from the writing. And so I knew that when I wrote my first book, I wanted people to see what the scriptures said. Um, and so instead of just referencing the scriptures in my book, I put the scriptures in my book. So anyone who's read my uh, any of my books know that the scriptures I'm talking about are actually in the book in their in their context. Um, well, you know, I always encourage people to go back and read the verses that I'm pulling out in their actual context. But you know, that's that's why I started to write the books in the way that I did because I wanted people to see what was me and in all of my books the margins are always different when it's me versus when it's the scriptures so it's, so it should be very clear and um i i always um try to reference the scriptures instead of other people and you know since i was a kid reading that you know first book on the second coming it just it, it, it turned me off to reading you know, books written by other people. Uh, instead, I wanted to learn about things from source documents. Um, and that's what I've done. Um, so, so you know, you know, people may be surprised when they find out that, no, I, you know, I have not read most books from most LDS authors. Um, everything, I, everything that I do, I try to base from the scriptures. Okay. Um... There's two two questions here. One, uh, somebody asked uh, about the reference for the Ezra's eagle. Um, I, she couldn't quite make out the name of things. If you want to just clarify that, where exactly it's found. So that's you know, there's there's many apocryphal books, but typically when we talk about the apocrypha, we're talking about 14 apocryphal books that used to be included in the King James Bible up until about the turn of the 20th century when the Church of England decided, hey, we're gonna pull these out. But up until I think it was about 1886, all of these apocryphal books were included in the King James Bible. And there is a book that's called Second Esdras, there's First Esdras, Second Esdras. Different religions call them different things. I think the Jews actually call it Fourth Esdras, um, Fourth Ezra. Esdras is the Greek name for Ezra. Um, the same Ezra that's in the Bible. So when you're reading the Apocrypha, and there in the second book of Ezra, there are seven visions that Ezra has. And the vision of Ezra's eagle, I believe, is the second of those. All seven of Ezra's visions are absolutely astounding. Um, but this particular vision, if you're interested in it, I believe it's uh, second Ezra's chapter 10 through 12. <clears throat> Okay. Now, when you were talking about that at the beginning, you made me wonder, like, uh, Joseph Smith asked the Lord if he should translate the Apocrypha. Was it actually a separate section in his Bible? I had assumed it was a separate book, but it was in his Bible. It was in his Bible, which is why he asked uh, if he should translate it. Um, and what the Lord told him is very interesting. M most people just kind of dismiss the Apocrypha, but the Lord said, listen, you don't need to translate the Apocrypha because it's mostly, you know, translated correctly already. Um, he says it does include some interpolations by men, which means men added things to it. Uh, it says that aren't correct. But if you read the Apocrypha with the spirit, you will be benefit by, benefited by it. And so I have always wanted to learn anything that anything that the Lord has caused to be written. I want to read it. and. I mean, we're reading, you know, our Sunday school lesson, you know, this Sunday was, you know, what, uh, uh, Abraham chapter one and two, and then, you know, in uh, Genesis, 
Um, in Abraham chapter one, he talks about, hey, I received the records from the fathers uh, and I have a chronology from the days of Adam to my day. Now in the King James Bible, we have 16 pages, that's all. But he had much more than that. Right. Um, the plates of brass say that there were many more prophecies in the plates of brass than were included um, in the Bible. That's one of the things that Nephi saw. So now we, you know, we've started discovering these caches of ancient documents, and some of them have been mentioned in the Bible, but were were lost. Um, the Book of Enoch is a, a great example. The, the uh, Lord said in the Doctrine and Covenants, listen, the Book of Enoch will be testified of in due time. And we didn't even have an English translation of the Book of Enoch at the time that um, that was stated in the, the Doctrine and Covenants. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think that it, it's important to have an open mind when it comes to this stuff. And it's also critical to understand what the Holy Ghost feels like. And, you know, the reason that we believe that the Book of Mormon is true is because the Holy Ghost tells us that it's true. Um, if the Holy Ghost can tell us that the Book of Mormon is true, it can tell us, you know, other, you know, documents are true. Or, you know, I've read, there are many apocryphal books that I have read and gone, oh, this is baloney. But there have also been some gems, absolute gems that I just treasure. Um, can you, can so you uh, one of the questions is a list of recommended books to read from you. So do you want to just expound on a few of the, yeah, the favorites? Yeah, one, of, one of the things that I would love to do is compile um, a, a book of all of my favorite, you know, apocryphal writings, because, you know, listen, let me just show you uh, some of my, my books on this. So this is... Um, Let's see. This is volume two of the Judah. Uh, is this backwards or can you? No, it's, I can read it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so this is volume two. This thing's got about 1500 pages of ancient manuscripts in it. This one's volume one. It's got a, about another 1500 pages in it. Um, I've got uh, another, oh, geez. This book, it's a, you know, uh, Sumerian tablets that have been translated. It's fascinating. Uh, this book, it's called The Other Bible. Um, it's just tra it's translations of the Dead Sea Scroll documents. Um, I mean, that? there are so many of these. Um, what was the Sumerian one? You, you kind of held it up too quick. It was a little shaky. Uh, yeah, so it's, uh, it's called The Complete Anunnaki Bible. And uh, all it is, I mean, the ancient civilizations refer to the Sumerians as the Anunnakis. And um, it's just a translation of cuneiform tablets. Um, <laughs> and I got to, you know, some of these things aren't going to be of interest to anyone, you know, on this Zoom call. But I mean, some, the, the Sumerian, in the Doctrine and Covenants, it says, listen, um, you should seek to un understand a history of nations. Um, and that's, that's why I like studying about some of these things. But the Sumerians, I mean, they're an archaeological anomaly. Okay, so it's the first major civilization in recorded history, and it pops out of nowhere. It has a language that's unlike anything on Earth, and it has a fully written, a fully written language. Has advanced mathematics, and some of these uh, tablets that they've translated, they have the exact orbital uh, calculations of Jupiter around the Sun, and I mean, this is in Sumer. So, I mean, these guys, they were, you know, incredible, um, you know, the, the knowledge that they had. And I mean, some of, the, some of the things are so, you know, amazing that I, I, I wouldn't even mention them on this call. Um, but I, one of you asked, what are some of my, my favorites? Well, I got to say, one of my favorite apocryphal books is the book of Joseph and Asenath. Um, it's ju it's just such a gem. This is uh, how Joseph in Egypt meets his wife Asenath. Uh, we know Asenath is his uh, um, is his wife from uh, the book of Genesis, but we don't know much about her. Um, and this apocryphal book, when when you know I read it, it just resonates with me. And yeah, you know, I know that it's true. And uh, I've written. Um, uh, one of the chapters in my uh, book, A Remnant Shall Return, 
has a chapter, The Canaanites in Egypt, and I, I include extracts from that book uh, in that. So, so that's, that's one of my favorites. Um, and you can listen to that. Um, I'm, my entire book, A Remnant Shall Return, you can listen to as a podcast. If you're interested in listening to that section, uh, I think it's like chapter 32 or something like that, but it's, it's Canaanites in, in Egypt. That one's a treasure. Um, one of the other ones that I just absolutely love, and surprisingly, I, I think this was included in um, the plates of, plates of brass because um, Nephi talks about the book of Adam and Eve. Um, and this, the apocryphal book of Adam and Eve was translated from um, Egyptian um, uh, papyrus and not by any, you know, religious uh, people, but it, you know, it was a, a secular translation of it. So it doesn't have the smooth flowing William Tyndall sounding language, but I got to tell you, it is just, it's such a touching book to me because it talks about how Adam and Eve felt and their struggles once they were in the presence of God and then left the garden and how hard that was for them adjusting to life outside of the presence of God. And you know, so many of the things that they talk about just fit perfectly with the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. So, um, I mean, that's, that's another of my, my absolute favorites. That's but the second book of Esdras is one of my favorites too. Where's the Adam and Eve one found? Um, you, you know, if you, if you were to, I mean, it's, it's obviously in these books. I mean, it's, you're not going to go and, and buy a book that just has, you know, that in it, um, because it's just one of many ancient manuscripts that's been translated. That, that book itself would probably only be you know, 50 pages, something like that. Um, so it, you just have to look for um, some compilation of ancient writings that includes the Lost Books of Eden. Um, but that's great. That's what, that's why I'd love to do a compilation of my favorites because I get asked that question all the time. Yeah. I, I am fascinated. Um, my wife and I have got tuned into some uh, audio recordings of interviews that an, another individual did who was very much into ancient manuscripts. And um, it, it has been so fascinating. He, he claims there's 5 million documents that uh, reference Jesus Christ. Uh, his travels and things that we don't have any record of in the scriptures um, from around the world. And so I, I am just, you know, I, I know this is the, the last days and there's going to be records coming forth and it's exciting to see um, some of these things um, brought forth or, you know, to, to just have there because they came from somewhere. And, and yeah, I, I've read some like you, that's like, okay, that's full of malarkey or that's, <laughs> yeah. that's a wild exaggeration. You know, he yelled and destroyed an army. Mm, <laughs> I'm, I'm yeah. pretty sure that's <laughs> not quite what it is. But, um, yeah, and that, that's why, I mean, you, if you understand what the spirit feels like when you're reading the scriptures, I mean, you can know, hey, I don't need to waste any more time on this one. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, so I, I can go through a lot of these pretty quickly because it feels different. Yeah. So, okay, here's a, a couple more questions and, and comments from people. One one person posted, there is a website, and I, I actually... Uh, uh, well, I'll just mention this. There's a website called sacredtexts.com. There's a hyphen between sacred and texts, and they have thousands of books. I actually have uh, been on that website enough that I, I just, <laughs> I bought their little USB stick <laughs> of everything uh -huh. sitting right here. And, you know, a lot of the stuff's in public domain. And, and for those that are scripture notes users, I plan on adding these into scripture notes um, as soon as we can get the uh, library module finished up. But um Anyway, there's, there's a ton out there, uh, but there are others that, um, you know, it's nice to have a book that's formatted, and there's, there's a lot of stuff that's not on that site. Like Michael mentioned, the uh, Lost Books of the Bible. There's, I've got a book right here. Oh, yeah, The Lost Books of the Bible um, by Bell. And so there, there's a lot of resources out there that lead to some fascinating things, and it, it's not like it replaces your scripture study in some way. I know some people are like, oh, well, you know, if I do this, and I'm not studying the scriptures. Well, you know, Mike, why don't you just talk for a minute? And then I've, there are some more questions here, but what's kind of like your study schedule? Like, when do you uh, have time to do like your regular study schedule for, 
gospel doctrine class, Sunday school, or versus diving into some of these other things? And um, you know, what's your kind of study schedule like? Uh, so, I mean, that's that's an interesting thing because you know it's it's not really a study schedule uh, for me. Um, this is something that I'm thinking about all the time, um, and you know, when when I'm driving somewhere, I'm you know, I just love listening to you know, different things. And then I, you know, I just love thinking uh, about them all the time. And so it's not like, you know, I'm going and, and in fact, it, let me just tell you how my approach to the scriptures has changed because it used to be that, you know, I would just take the scriptures and I just read them through, you know, cover to cover. And, you know, it got to the point where you know, for some reason I can remember the scriptures very well. Um, and I couldn't remember my textbooks in college very well, but I can remember the scriptures, you know, very well for it. You know, it must be a, you know, a gift that I have, but <clears throat> for years, you know, it, it got to the point where it almost became, you know, and I don't want to sound sacrilegious, but it almost became boring for me to read the Book of Mormon because um, I knew the story so well um, that I knew what was coming next. And, you know, it, you know, I went and I talked to my parents about this and I said, you know, I'm just having a hard time feeling like I'm getting anything out of the scriptures because yeah, I've read it so, so many times. And, you know, I asked for their counsel on that. And it wasn't until I had, um, I mean, the hardest thing that I had ever gone through in my entire life <clears throat> happened to me. And I mean, it just changed everything for me. Um, I mean, I was very familiar with the surface of the scriptures. But what I didn't understand is that the scriptures are like an onion and I had memorized. I mean, I, I could literally, I mean, we used to play this game, my family, they would open up the scriptures and they'd start reading a verse and I'd tell them where, where they were reading. And, but at the same time, I could tell them those kinds of things, but I didn't understand what they were really talking about. There was such a depth to the scriptures that I was completely oblivious to. Um, and it wasn't until I had this experience in my life that made me challenge my, you know, my own competence to the, to the, to the point that I just felt that I was an utter fool. And, you know, all my pride went out the window and I could be taught um, in a way that I wasn't able to be taught when I thought I knew everything, when the scriptures had become boring to me because I, I thought I knew everything. I mean, you read, you, you know, start reading a verse and I tell you where it was, but I knew nothing, you know, really I knew nothing about what the scriptures had to offer. And I was dumbfounded when I realized the depth that is in the scriptures, absolutely amazed. Um, and so that's when things changed for me. And I stopped reading the scriptures in, you know, sequential order. And I started focusing on prophecies and topics. And it got to be where you know, I began, you know, studying something, reading something and thinking about it. And as I'm thinking about it, thoughts are coming into my mind. And so I, I go and start going, studying those thoughts and then more thoughts come. And it comes to be this chain where all these things are connected and these beautiful and intricate patterns that just astounded me and continue to astound me, um, you know, to this day. But I never saw it um before you know i had you know these 
these experiences, these crushing, life-altering, you know, experiences. And, and hopefully, you know, everyone doesn't have to go through something like that, but um, there is profound depth to the scriptures that I was shocked uh, by. Um, and in order for me to understand it, I needed to, to be taught by the spirit instead of by a study guide, if that, you know, makes sense. Yeah, totally. I, I think I, I'm not going to say I went through something similar, like, like what you just described, but um, I, I've gone through, I think everybody has to go through that transition from, okay, I'm reading the scriptures, I'm getting the stories, and then something happens and you go, wait a sec, I am clueless <laughs> as to what is going on. And one of the things that impacted me was a few years ago, I started listening to a, a particular podcast by somebody that had studied the scriptures all his life. And I was just like, every single podcast, I was going, well, why have I never heard this? And, and I was like, I, I think I'm aware, you know, like, uh, I've been around the block, I've read the scriptures and uh, other writings and stuff. And I was so, I guess, humbled, you know, to just kind of go, um, wow, I, I had not even seen this depth. And uh, it really caused me to, to start studying topically a lot more. And um, anyway, there's a question here. As you mentioned some of these things, um, somebody would like to know, what are some of the podcast things that you listen to that you've learned from? You know, I, again, you know, and I don't, I don't want to be offensive, but I've never listened to a religious podcast. Um, what I listen to are, you know, the, the scriptures, <laughs> you know, like when I, you know, have a long drive, um, and I've had many long drives. I used to commute from Tennessee to North Carolina uh, every week. And so I'd have, you know, six and a half hours in the car. And, you know, when you, when you listen to the entire book of Second Nephi in a single setting, it's different. You start seeing things come together differently. Um, and, you know, to me, it comes down to, you know, and, and please don't take this the wrong way. Um, I know that there are there are many podcasts out there, and there's lots of people that I'm sure are very helpful to people. Um, but it's not my preferred way. Um, my preferred way has been to listen to the this from the source, and then be listening for the Holy Ghost to emphasize things that I'm hearing and then stop and just ponder on those things. And I'll tell you what, um, it's a, it's a, it's a paradigm shift to go from thinking that if you want to understand the scriptures, you need to be taught by an expert uh, in the scriptures to be moving to the paradigm of Nephi uh, who I mean, he heard his father tell him things and he pondered on those. But instead of going to his father to have him explain these things to him, like Laman and Lemuel did, he believed differently than Laman and Lemuel. Laman and Lemuel's paradigm was, yeah, the Lord can make these things known to my father. And if I want to know these things, I can go to my father. That was not what Nephi thought. And it's evident in his writings. I mean, First Nephi chapter one, verse one, he says, you know, I, Nephi, having been born of goodly parents, therefore I was taught somewhat after all the learning of my father. What does the word somewhat mean? It means to a lesser degree. But then he goes on to say, but I was highly favored of the Lord and came to have a great knowledge of the mysteries of God. So where did Nephi's great knowledge of the mysteries of God come from? Because he's saying that he was taught somewhat by his father, but he obtained great knowledge of the mysteries of God. And we have a negative connotation in the church about the mysteries of God. Um, but what we don't realize is the greatest mystery of the Old Testament is that Jehovah is Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. The Jews 
missed that. That is what the mysteries of God are. They're vital to our salvation, but they're not things that you're going to necessarily learn from someone else. They're things that the Lord will teach you if you are willing to go to him and be taught by him. Why did 98% of the Jewish nation reject Jesus Christ? The Jews were taught by the Jews, by their rabbis in the synagogues. They knew the law. They knew the scriptures. They practiced their feasts. Their kids went to early morning seminary and memorized passages. Um, But yet they rejected the very God that they worshiped. Why? Because they had outsourced their religious education. They'd given it to someone else and said, you teach me what I need to know. And there was a very small percentage of the population that learned another another way. They learned what the spirit feels like and to follow that. And you know, many people that I have spoken with, they expect that you know, the prophet's going to teach them everything that they need to know. Well, I tend, you know, in all of my studies, you know, patterns, there is something to patterns. And what happened to the Jewish people will absolutely happen again. You know, they were not prepared for the coming of Christ. And the world is not prepared for the coming of Christ now. Most people have no idea what's about to happen. Um, and if you want to be prepared, you, there's a reason that President Nelson is saying, listen, you will not survive the coming day unless you have the constant guiding influence of the Holy Ghost to be with you. But he doesn't tell us why. You know, he, there is a, a constant message, if you go to lds.org, and from the prophet's message, messages himself, is about hearing him, learning What does the Lord's voice sound like? You know, we need to learn how to be taught by the Lord and not outsource our spiritual education to other men. Otherwise, there's a whole, you know, there's many magnitudes of difference between the education that you can get from men and the education that you can get from God. And God wants to teach us. There is a reason that the scriptures say many times, ask and ye shall receive, knock and it shall be opened unto you. We are supposed to be seeking him, pondering these things, learning how to learn from the spirit. And you know, we all have different spiritual gifts. You know, some people can, you know, sing, some people can you know, have the gift of administration. Some people have the gift of tongues. I mean, we all have different spiritual gifts and they're meant to help us, you know, rise together. And the Lord tends to speak to us most clearly through our spiritual gifts that we have. And we should share those gifts, you know, with others, but we shouldn't be content um, with that information secondhand. We should always want the Lord to confirm these things to us. And that's exactly what Nephi teaches us over and over and over again in his writings. So, so, okay, we got a lot of questions pouring in here, but I, to me, like, I, um, I enjoy listening to a podcast, not to just learn from somebody else secondhand, but as a catalyst. Like yeah, Nephi, and, and, you know, and pl- please do not, you know, uh, listen to all the podcasts you want. Um, I'm just saying that I don't. Um, sure. No, and, and I totally see that value. It, uh, somebody asked, uh, you know, do you just listen through the Gospel Library app, or do you listen to? Uh, yeah, something? mostly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I, I, to me, yeah. Whatever. Whenever somebody shares something in sacrament meeting or. A general conference talk or whatever it it's an invitation right if I, if there's an insight there it's like hmm i need to go study a little bit more on that and uh write some things down and uh try to understand that better and so it's not 
it's not a, a, a passive activity. It's an, it's an active, uh, you know, I've acquired this insight. What do I do with it now? And before we officially started our, our uh, discussion today, you and I talked and I asked about uh, the importance of writing. And, uh, you know, I think it'd be good if you just kind of reviewed that for people like, why, why should you write the things that you're learning? Well, you know, writing things down shows the Lord that what he has told you is important to you. Um, and so I have found that when I write things down, you know, sacred experiences, um, sacred education, um, the more that I write, the more that I receive. So I encourage everybody to, you know, write the sacred things that happen to them in their journals, it, you know, write it down somewhere. Um, and if you do, yeah, I have, I've been amazed at the times where I start writing about a particular passage at the inspiration that comes to me as I'm writing, you know, the moment that I'm writing. Um, it's, it's amazing to me. So, you know, it's, it's a very useful tool for me. Absolutely. Not, no questions asked there. I mean, it's no doubt. Okay, let me, uh, so um, let's, let's tackle, okay, somebody has asked the question, in your opinion, how far are we from the second coming? Yeah, so, you know, obviously, you know, no man knows the hour, right? But what most people don't understand is that there's the second coming of the Lord, and there's the great and dreadful day of the Lord. The great and dreadful day of the Lord precedes the uh, second coming. Now, you know, there have been people on the earth that have been thinking that the second coming was imminent, you know, for many generations, right? I think that the thing that is missing from all of this is in order to put the prophecies in context is the Lord has covenanted with Israel, that he would do certain things. Um, and that is the context of the second coming. The Lord is coming. The second coming of the Lord is to save the Jews from complete and utter annihilation. Um, so he's, it's par and parcel with the covenants that he, was ma he has made. Now, when you look at those covenants, to me, it is crystal clear that we are living in the last days. And, you know, these events are not going to be events that, you know, for a distant generation to see. We are going to see these things. We are going to live during the millennium. Um, if I were to put, you know, a number on it, I believe that, you know, well, maybe I shouldn't say this, but I believe that these things are not decades off. We're not talking about decades um, away. I could see all of these things. I could see the millennium happening. Well, uh, let me put it this way. When in the book of Revelation, you know, John sees this book and it has seven seals, right? And in the Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord asks, or Joseph Smith asks the Lord via the Urim and Thummim, what are these seals? What does it mean? And, you know, the Lord tells him, listen, none of those are a thousand year periods. Um, and so you go through and in the, the, chronology of the Bible starts at 4,000 BC. If you look in your Bible dictionary under chronology, that's what it will say. Fall of Adam, 4,000 BC. So you go, okay, first seal, 4,000 to 3,000 BC. Second seal, 3,000 to 2,000 BC. Third seal, 2,000 to 1,000 BC, so on. That puts the beginning of the seventh seal in our day. 
And the events that John saw when he opens the seventh seal, and this is in Revelation chapter eight, it is the only seal that begins in such a way that when he opens it up, he says, and I, you know, there was silence in the heavens for about the space of half an hour. And then after that silence, the fur starts to fly on planet earth. So it's really interesting that he says about the space of half an hour. Um, and clearly he wasn't talking, you know, a literal 30 minute period of time when you know, Peter was talking about these things in his writings. He said, writing, you know, to the saints, you know, who were wondering if Christ was coming in their day. He said, listen, guys, you need to understand that a thousand years to the Lord is as one year unto man. And that, you know, people are going to begin to mock uh, the saints in the last day saying, hey, where's the coming of the Lord? Since the beginning of time, all things can uh, continue as they ever have been. Um, so understanding that the Lord operates on his timetable, which is, you know, again, many times in scriptures, that's referred to as a thousand years uh, to man is one day to the Lord. If, if you use that time frame, it's very interesting because that, you know, translates into a time period of around the year 2020, the fur is going to start to fly. Um, and you look at what's happened since 2020 and things are just different. I don't care what country you are in, things are different worldwide now. Um, there's been a fundamental shift in many governments. Um, there's much more you know, oppression of freedoms. There's much more oppression of ideas, um, freedom of speech. Uh, there seems to be more of a controlled narrative that's hurting us towards socially engineered scenarios. These are all things when you study the events of the last days that are foretold. Um, and so all of these things, but mostly the covenants that the Lord has made with the house of Israel convince me that, I mean, geez, just look at you know, the prophecy of Ezra's eagle um, that says basically, hey guys, um, before the end of Biden's administration, something catastrophic will take place in America. So if you're looking for time frames, yeah, and nobody hopes that Ezra, that I got Ezra's eagle wrong more than me. Um, because, you know, it's, it's scary what it talks about, but it's got to get bad before it gets better. And incredible things are coming our way. Terrible things are coming our way. But what, what lies on the other side of these things you know, are just beyond belief in their scale of awesomeness. I promise you that whatever you are thinking is going, the millennium is going to be like, it is many magnitudes of awesomeness beyond that. It, it's going to be incredible, but it's also going to be soon. Okay, let's, uh, as kind of a follow-up, since uh, it relates to this, what would, what would you think uh, the half hour of silence actually is? Do you think it's just the Lord saying, it's not that there was, no revelation coming down and, and the Lord hasn't been no. sharing his spirit. So is it just a sort of a, a game delay? Like the fourth quarter started and we, you know, so, they've got so to bring the scriptures, the scriptures talk about two different half hours of silence. Okay. Um, the doctrine and covenants talks about a uh, half an hour of silence and it's not about a half an hour. It is a half an hour. Um, and then you have John's about the half an hour. So there's, there's two different ones. I believe that John's is meant to say, hey, listen, when the seventh seal happens, the world doesn't end right away. You know, there's a period of time where things are somewhat normal, but in the context of his writings, you know, the silence in heaven ends with the, an angel in heaven who's blasting a trumpet and then catastrophic things start happening. So I think that 
John's half an hour of silence is talking more about, hey guys, this isn't happening at the year 2000. Um, you're going to start seeing things really get weird about a half an hour after this seal opens, which according to the Lord's time would put that in the year 2020. Now, the other um, half an hour of silence that's spoken of, I believe this is Doctrine and Covenant section 45, um, that is a literal half an hour. And you know, when, when you read about the um, events that take place in the last days, one of the, the pivotal things that takes place is you have these two amazing men in Jerusalem. Uh, John talks about these, Isaiah talks about these. Uh, those same chapters are transcripted into the Book of Mormon. Um, these men do amazing things to preserve the Jewish state from total annihilation against this Antichrist that will arise in the last days, who will be something just, you know, totally different than anything we have on our radar right now. Um, and he sieges Jerusalem. Um, for three and a half years. And if not for these two prophets, you know, Jerusalem would be overrun. But these prophets, they have control of the elements. They can do, you know, amazing things. But at the very end, the Antichrist um, prevails over these two prophets and kills them. And they lie in the streets for three and a half days, you know, which again mirrors the three and a half years that uh, Jerusalem was under siege by this guy. And then the Lord um, calls them up and they stand upon their feet. And that's what I think the half an hour of silence is. You know, everyone is shot in shock and awe because it says the whole world is celebrating, you know, the demise of these two prophets because, you know, they, there was nothing they could do a, a, against Jerusalem because of these guys. And now they're dead. And then, all of a sudden, they're not dead. They're resurrected in the eyes of everybody. And um, then a half an hour after that, you know, Christ comes and the earth is purged um, in incredible way. Um, you know, Zechariah talks about the curse of the Lord. And I mean, it's, it's Raiders of the Lost Ark kind of stuff, right? <laughs> Where, you know, I mean, people are dissolved upon their feet. Um, and it's, it's not just the army that's surrounding um, Jerusalem. It's, it's worldwide. The wicked are dissolved. Um, and you know, there's no one left but, but righteous people. So, yeah, I don't know if that answered your question or not. Yeah, uh, I, I think that was uh, helpful. So um, here's a, uh, another set of questions, actually. Um, and I'm going to kind of combine a couple of these. Um, does it trouble you or appear that many members of the church will not see or understand or be prepared for the forthcoming trials? And is there uh, some message or teaching that you've taught your family to kind of help navigate things as the church gets rocked or, you know, the, the things going on in the church or in society that uh, may be uh, kind of a stumbling block for a lot of people? Yeah, you know, this goes back to you know, what happened to the Jews. Um, the Jews, they were utterly unprepared for the coming of the Messiah. They had prophets that taught them. They ignored their prophets. We have prophets that teach us, which we venerate, but we also ignore. Um, our prophet has urged us in general conference to learn, he's pleaded, he's begged us to do the spiritual work necessary to understand what the Lord feels like in our life. He has invited us to study the covenants and promises that the Lord has made with the house of Israel and told us, if you study those, you will be amazed. He has told us that there is nothing that is happening on the earth today that is more important than the gathering of the house of Israel. There is nothing that will be more marvelous than the gathering of Israel. Um, 
you think about everything that's going on in the world today, that there are many uh, scriptures that say, when Israel is restored, it will rival the exodus of Egypt for its wonder and its might and its magnificence. Most people have no idea about any of that. And there are many prophets in the Book of Mormon. This, this is a central theme in the Book of Mormon, but people don't realize it because you know, Nephi was really the first one to start talking about this. And it happened after he, he prayed to the Lord to see the vision of Lehi. And then he sees and records much more than what we have from his father Lehi. But remember, we only have what Lehi talked about because Nephi put it in there. And the 116 pages were lost. And Nephi wanted to summarize what his father talked about. And he ends his summary really in 1 Nephi chapter 9 after he describes the tree of life. And then he begins his writings by saying, you know, by discussing the tree of life. And when he starts seeing what takes place in our days, he says, I saw that the whore of Babylon will wage war against the saints of God. And I saw that the saints of God would be endowed. Well, what he says, if you, and the, the words are very important. He says that he saw the saints of God and the covenant people of the Lord. Two people. You, I mean, you should be thinking about that going, whoa, whoa, the saints of God are the covenant people of the Lord. What's he talking about? Multiple times in Nephi's vision, the angel says, listen, Nephi, you understand the covenants that the Lord has made with the house of Israel, don't you? Nephi says, yes. I wish that he said, no, tell me. But he says, yes. And the angel asks him again, just a couple of verses later, remember thou the covenants that the Lord has made with the house of Israel? He's telling us, guys, understand this. There is going to be a portion of the house of Israel and the saints, and both of them are going to be endowed with power. And then Nephi says, listen, I, I want to talk more about this, but the Lord tells me I can't. He says there will be others that talk about this. We know that Isaiah was one of those, and we know that John was one of those. Both of those people, their records, their writings, they're encrypted. They were written in such a way that they're, they're highly symbolic. And there was a reason for that. The Lord wanted only those people. It's like, it's like a parable. It's why the Lord spoke in parables. He wanted those that were truly interested and hungering and thirsting for that to be able to understand it. And those that were only casual, um, those who had outsourced their education to something else, to a study manual that covers the entire Book of Mormon, Isaiah chapters in a single chapter. Um, you're not going to get it. If you want to learn these things, you need to go to the Lord. You need to seek. You need to hunger and thirst for these things. Um, also embedded in that same you know, vision of Nephi's, the Lord all of a sudden is talking to Nephi. And he says, Nephi, guess what? I'm going to come and I'm going to talk to your people. Um, and I am going to expound these things and it's going to be of great benefit to the Gentiles. And so then you get to third Nephi and there is a section in third Nephi, an entire discourse. It's broken into two uh, sections. It starts in third Nephi chapter 15, verse 10. And then it goes to third Nephi chapter 17, verse four. That's the first part of it. And Christ stops the discourse because it goes, guys, I've been here all day. And I can see your eyes are glazing over. You're tired. And this message has been commanded me of the Father to give to you. And I'm not going to do it right now because you can't understand it. And it's too important. So go home and pray to the Lord that you can understand this. And then I'm going to come back tomorrow. And I'm going to tell, give the rest of this message to you. And that's exactly what happens. The Lord comes back in 3 Nephi chapter 20, again, verse 10. And says, now I'm going to continue the message that the Father commanded me to give to you. And we skip over this because it's isaiah E, But Christ is explaining the words of Isaiah. And in a masterful way, it's, it is the most 
succinct discourse about what's going to happen to the Gentiles in the last days of any prophecy, but we don't read it because we're lazy. We don't want to, you know, it's Isaiah E or, you know, it's confusing to us. We don't spend the time, but I guarantee every single one of us can understand that message. If we'll put it in the time, if we'll say, who are these pronouns? you know, that Christ is talking to. We need to understand that Christ is talking to the entire house of Israel in this discourse, not just the Nephites. And then it comes alive um, to us. And I mean, he, he says, listen, guys, I mean, you're within four generations, you're going to be wiped out. Um, but there will be a powerful nation that's established in America in the last days. And it will be blessed above all other nations. But the day will come that if the, that nation rejects Jesus Christ, me, then a remnant of Jacob will come amongst them and will wipe them out. And there is not a weapon on the planet, on earth, formed by man that will prosper against that a remnant of Jacob that will come. And it will utterly make waste the cities of the Gentiles. And I mean, the things that he talks about are fascinating. And then he goes on, he concludes his discourse by saying, listen, study the words of Isaiah. Ye ought to study these things. And then he goes, no, a commandment I give you that ye study these things. And then there's 19 Isaiah tra chapters transcribed into the Book of Mormon that Nephi saw would be included in the Bible, but transcribed anyway. That's because Nephi was trying to give us the cliff notes of Guys, study this. Most people don't realize that those chapters, those Isaiah chapters, they all talk about the restoration of the house of Israel in the last days and what will happen to the Gentiles. And it's astounding. So, so let me jump from where you're at right now, talking about the Gentiles, and jump back to the verse that you kind of started with that mentioned the saints and the covenant people. So how do you distinguish between the saints and the covenant people in that one verse, and then how the Book of Mormon calls the members of the church Gentiles, but we're also in a Gentile nation. So like, how do those things kind of tie together? Like, how do you distinguish them? So the Gentiles is a word that comes from the Jews, right? And, you know, when Nephi's writing this, he came out of Jerusalem. You know, even though he was descended from Joseph, he considered himself to be Jewish because he came out from the Jews. Um, he had an understanding of the Jews, um, but the plates of brass was not the Jewish account. The plates of brass was the account of the house of Israel, the other ten tribes. You know, Ephraim. You know, when the twelve tribes of Israel were divided um, amongst Jeroboam and Rehoboam, um, Judah had himself and you know Benjamin and. The other 10 uh, were to the northern kingdom of Israel. And, you know, they kept their records and the Jews kept their records. And the plates of brass represent the records of, you know, the 10 tribes up to that point and had different things, different prophecies. I mean, Nephi is talking about the allegory of the olive tree was from a prophet Zenus. I mean, that would he would have been known to the northern kingdom of Israel, but not to the Jews necessarily. Isaiah was known to both because Isaiah prophesied to both kingdoms and Israel was dispersed during that period of time. Um, and so the covenants, the covenant people of the Lord is referring to when the Lord would fulfill his covenant, which he made to restore Israel in the last days. And you can read about this covenant throughout the Old Testament, but um, in Deuteronomy chapter 30, in verses one through four, you know, this is right before, you know, the house of Israel enters into the land of Canaan and Moses isn't going to go with them. Moses gets translated and that's a whole nother topic. But Moses says, listen, I'm not, I'm not going in there with you guys, but you need to know we've gone through all of these covenants. You know, the covenants, if you go into these lands and you don't keep your covenants, the Lord is going to scatter you. And if there be those among you that are scattered to the utmost parts of heaven, in the last days, you will be gathered from thence. And so when the Lord is talking about 
the saints, he's talking about Joseph, who's being restored in the last days. You have basically in the scriptures, you have three parts of the house of Israel. You've got Joseph, you've got Judah, and you've got the lost tribes of Israel. And the whole allegory, which we don't have time to discuss, of the olive tree, talks about the scattering and re restoration of the house of Israel. And repeatedly we're, we're told that it will happen, the order in which Israel was scattered, it will be gathered in the reverse order. So the first portion of the house of Israel that was scattered was the lost 10 tribes of Israel. Um, they were captured by Assyria in 720-ish BC, and then they disappear from the historical record, except for a second Esdras talks about them. Um, and then you have the Jews that were scattered next, um, just about five years before Lehi leaves Jerusalem. Um, Babylon comes in and, you know, you know, you know, cleans Judah's clock and takes all of their most promising youth into Babylon. Daniel, this is when Daniel goes um, into Babylon. That happened five years. I mean, Lehi and his family are still in Jerusalem at that time. Um, and then Lehi leaves at 600 BC. So the reverse order of that is when they will be restored in the last days. So the first group of Israel to be restored was Joseph. The second group of Israel to be restored is Judah. And that you know, happened in 1948 when uh, the nation of Israel was restored again by the Lord in miraculous ways. I mean, if you, if you haven't studied the restoration of the Jewish nation, you have to. Um, the missing component is the lost tribes of Israel. And the 10th article of faith says, we believe in the literal gathering of the house of Israel. That has been going on since the restoration of the church. And then it says, and in the restoration of the lost 10 tribes. Those are two separate things. So I believe that what we're talking about here, when we're talking about the saints of the Lord and the covenant people of the Lord, we're talking about when the saints have been gathered and when the lost 10 tribes are restored. And that is a common theme in the Book of Mormon. Once you see it, it's everywhere. That makes a lot of sense. So how about the, the Gentiles then? America being a Gentile nation, being overrun by um, Jacob, a remnant of Jacob, uh, is that just talking about the cleansing of America? Or would you it's associate absolutely that talking with... talking about the cleansing of America. But also, anyone who is not Jewish is a Gentile. So, um, I mean... According to that definition, the lost tribes of Israel, um, they would be Gentiles to the Jews under that description. I mean, the Samaritans, those were the inhabitants of the ancestral lands of the lost 10 tribes uh, that they used to have. And, you know, those were the survivors um, that weren't carried away by um, Assyria. And then the king of Assyria brought at least five other nations into those lands to thoroughly mix them up. And so the Samaritans were hated by the Jews because they were mixed blood. Um, that they were definitely of the house of Israel. When Christ, Christ started his ministry by spending two days amongst the Samaritans. That's where he announced himself as the Messiah, was to the woman at the well who was a Samaritan woman. There's tremendous symbolism there. I wish that we had the record. I have scoured apocryphal uh, writings for what did, the, what did Christ teach the Samaritans for those two days? I have not found anything. That would be fascinating to you know, understand. And then he goes from Samaria to uh, teach to the Jews. Um, so. You know, I don't know if that answers your, your question or not, but according to the writings of the Book of Mormon, non-Jewish people were Gentiles. The United States of America would not be a Jewish nation. Um, consequently, it has the largest population of Jews anywhere outside of Israel, but it was certainly not founded by Jews. Um, I think that it was founded by the house of Joseph. It's a, a very interesting um, factoid for you, when George Washington was sworn in as the first president of the United States, he placed his hand upon the Bible. 
but he opened, or the Bible was open for him, and he placed his hand on the open Bible. And what does he what does he place his hand on? He places his hand literally on top of the pros- the prophecy that talks about Joseph being a fruitful bough and growing up and over the wall of the vineyard. There is no way that you can convince me that that was a coincidence. Right. Yeah. You know, right. It's symbolic of what America is. Yeah. Okay. Let's see here. Um, do you believe the, let's see, the two prophets uh, that will be in Jerusalem? Is it your opinion they'll be of the LDS leadership or will they be even known to the world as a whole? Uh, or could they just be raised up? Uh, to another nation and uh, they have a, a work and a prophecy uh, to do there for the Lord? Yes, that's a great question. There's actually three Jewish leaders that are talked about in the scriptures, prophetic leaders. So there's these two. And then, you know, in numerous prophecies, there's a man named David who comes. Um, people refer to him as a Davidic servant. Um, Zechariah talks about him. Ezekiel talks about him. Uh, when um, Orson Hyde dedicated Jerusalem for the gathering of the Jews, he talked about this David that would come in the last days. Joseph Smith talked about him extensively. Um, so there's there's not two, there's three. And the scriptures say some interesting things about all three of these people. Um, to the point that I believe that all three of them will come when the 10 tribes of Israel are restored, which will be a miraculous event. You can read about this. I mean, in, I mean, there's so many, so many prophecies that talk about this, but one of the, the clearest is in uh, Doctrine and Covenants section 133. And, um, you know, it, ta- it starts around, I think, verse 25 or 26. And it talks about this group of people that are going to come to America, to the children of Ephraim, um, and that they are going to be led by their prophets. And that when they return, the enemies of Israel will be a prey to them. And that they will come and fall down at the feet of the children of Ephraim and there be crowned uh, by the children of Ephraim. Um, And... Yeah, so I think that these two prophets and the Davidic servant are coming from that group of people. It's my opinion. When um, you talked about like the order being reversed, uh, do you do you then picture that the uh, the ten tribes are returning before the city of Enoch? Yes. And when it talks about them in the North Country, I know from. One of your books, you, t- you talk a little about that. Um, can you explain a little about um, where you think they will return to? Because like the city of Enoch was taken from the Gulf of Mexico, according to Joseph Smith and, and stuff. So if that comes back there, are the 10 tribes going to come back um, in a specific geographic location, kind of like that? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, Ether talks about this. So do you have your scriptures? Yes. Just take it, open your scriptures up to Ether chapter 13 and read verse 3. All righty. <clears throat> verse 3. And that it was the place of the new Jerusalem, which is talking down, about America. Yep. Which should come down out of heaven and the holy sanctuary of the Lord. Okay. So the new Jerusalem is coming from where? <laughs> Down out of heaven. Ether wasn't the only one to say that. Uh, John the Revelator said that he saw the new Jerusalem adorned as a bride descending out of heaven. Interestingly enough, when Moroni, this is in you know, the same chapter that you just read from, he starts describing what's going to happen in America. And then he goes... I can't say anymore. The Lord tells me to knock it off. 
It's very interesting. Mormon, Moroni's father, when he was transcribing and recording and summarizing and abridging all the things that Christ taught, he says, I was about to write everything that Christ taught us about what's going to happen. And he said, no, you're not. You're not going to put that stuff in there. Said, you put this stuff in there to start with. Because I want to test my people. And if they will receive this, They'll receive the rest. And he talks about how they'll receive it through the Holy Ghost. So there are people, this message is in the scriptures. And there are people who wanted to talk about it, but who were stopped from talking about it because the Lord intends this to be a test. Just like the coming of Jesus Christ was a test for the Jews. In the Doctrine and Covenants, we are told that the entire church is under condemnation because we've treated lightly the Book of Mormon. Ezra Tep Benson said, guys, the church is still under condemnation for treating lightly the Book of Mormon. Why? Because the critical messages in the Book of Mormon, we skip over. We we focus on the stories and the things that are easy to understand. Um, But there is a message that Christ was commanded to share with us. And I mean, the way that he kicks it off, it's, it's so incredible to me. I mean, Jesus Christ is incredible. Everything he does is incredible. Uh, but the way that he, he does this, he's trying to slap us in the face and say, listen to what I'm saying. He says, you know what, guys? When I was with the Jews, the Father wouldn't let me tell them anything other than other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Um, and that... I would go and minister to them and that they would hear my voice. And the Jews presumed that I was talking about the Gentiles. And so they never asked me any other questions about it. But guys, that wasn't right. You are the other sheep that I was talking about. And I would have talked to the Jews more about this, but the ball was in their court and they didn't do anything. But I'm telling you guys now that you're not the only other sheep that I have. There's a whole nother group that the father has led away out of the land. And I am going to go minister to them, the lost tribes of Israel, for they are not lost in the father, for he knoweth whither he hath taken them. So we should be having bells go off in our head when Christ is telling the Nephites this. Because he just got finished saying, yeah, you know what? The Jews didn't ask about you, so I didn't tell them. But I'm telling you, there's other guys out there. What does Christ want us to be asking? He wants us to be seeking information about the lost tribes of Israel. That's what his whole discourse is about. But we skip over it. Um, we, don't, we don't pay it the attention that we should, and it's to our own detriment. So kind of coming back to the beginning of this question, um, part of part, the end part was, is there something, and, and like I recognize, you know, what you said before, President Nelson's been telling us for six, seven years now, get personal revelation. You have to be taught by the Lord himself. You've, you know, you're not going to spiritually survive what's coming. And so, I mean, that is the message, right? It is learn to get revelation, learn to take the time to seek the Lord and uh, make that time, that sacred time, uh, where you're, you're putting yourself in tune with the Lord every day. And so, um, but the, the end of this other person's question was, is there a message that you've shared with your family? And I don't know if it would be something other than that, but something to sort of navigate what's coming um, as the world basically gets shaken. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that, yes, you know, I talked to my family about this. Um, even my very youngest child, you know, knows all about this. Um, I think that there are there are four critical things um, that you've got to understand the context of these four things if you really want to understand what's going to take place in the last days. I think the first one comes from the concept, you know, in the Pearl of Great Price, where we receive three different accounts of worlds without number. Right? We we need to understand that we're I mean, we're talking, if the gospel is true for us, it applies to the entire universe. 
what does Christianity mean in an infinite universe? In a universe where our scriptures tell us that the atonement of Jesus Christ was infinite and eternal, and that through that atonement, the inhabitants of other worlds become the begotten sons and daughters of God. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that the whore of Babylon is real. Um, secret combinations are real. And the events that take place in the last days are happening largely through the coordinated efforts of the whore of Babylon. Um, the third thing is that the scriptures talk about an antichrist that will come in the last days that will deceive even the very elect according to the covenant. And the prophecies about this guy are off the charts. Um, I mean, this guy, he destroys faith on a global basis. Um, Christianity all but withers on the vine because of this guy. And you know, according to what Daniel says, because of his marvelous blasphemies against the Most High. And the things that he can do, and the evidence that he produced, um, and who he is, you know, they, this is why President Nelson is saying, listen, unless you have the constant guiding influence of the Holy Ghost, because most people aren't going to have a clue about this in advance, unfortunately. And so they are going to be utterly dependent upon the promptings of the Holy Ghost, which in the moment, you have to know what it feels like, because all evidence will be to the contrary. And the fourth thing is the Lord is going to restore the house of Israel and the restoration of the, of the house of Israel will shape the events of the last days more profoundly than almost any other thing. So those are the four things that I would say you need to understand. And I mean, that's, that's woven. If you've read any of my books, I mean, all four of those things, you know, are woven throughout the narrative. Yeah, that's, I, I, I like the way you put those together. That's a, an interesting pattern. Um, and I think we are, we are in the most interesting of times uh, as, as we're moving forward. One, one of the questions that came up, well, actually, actually two of them, and I, and I think we've kind of addressed this one. You know, somebody asked, how can we best prepare temporally for what's coming? And I, I think in essence, it's your spiritual preparation and just ask the Lord, you know, what is it that you, you know, that I need to prepare for temporally? Um, but that spiritual preparation is is the the key. Because yeah, like yeah, absolutely. I mean, whatever happens, if if we're the Lord's people, he's gonna take care of us. You know, some will die, some some will suffer what's coming um, because the rain comes down on everybody, right? But um, the Lord has also empowered his servants in the past to multiply food, to stop uh armies and and so that spiritual preparation is is the most important thing that uh, we can do so um last question here well somebody just asked if this is recorded it is recorded and it'll it'll be uh released um probably this week so um the last question here um do you believe uh, you know are we in an actual seven years of tribulation is it now? Is it, you know, when is that? Is it actually seven years or is that symbolic and, um, you know, more of a, a Hebrew seven, you know, it's a, a complete time of uh, tribulation? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, so I don't think that it's exactly seven years. I think that that it's approximately seven years. And I think that those years of tribul tribulation, I mean, this comes from Daniel, right? Um <clears throat> Daniel 12 verse 1 says, you know, that there will come a time of trouble since never there was since there was a nation. This is the, the period uh, uh, of tribulation. And um, it revolves. And, you know, everything that I know about um, the times um, pertaining to the seven-year period comes from the writings of Daniel. Um, he refers to it more like, Six years, six years, 10 months, but it's reign of this antichrist. <clears throat> um, and 
you know, three and a half years of his reign are focused on destroying the Jews and besieging Jerusalem. But the period of time before that, um, he's, he's focused here. I mean, America is the most powerful nation on the earth, bar none. Um, China doesn't even come close to um, America. Uh, regardless of you know, of what you um, may have have read, there's just there's just no substitute for the United States uh, of America, and this is you know where he's going to be. And the scriptures you know talk about that and how his reign in America comes to an abrupt and unforeseen um, conclusion, which is just you know totally awesome. Uh, but it has to do with the restoration of the House of Israel. Okay. <clears throat> well, um, Michael, I just want to express appreciation for myself and everyone else that uh, you've taken the time to chat with us today. Um, you know, it's a, a pleasure to talk to you and, um, you know, not just because you're insightful, but you uh, have, have done, you know, some great study and, um, you know, really have uh, provided a spiritual uh, opportunity for us to learn from. And, uh, so I want to thank you for being with us today. And, um, yeah, thanks for having me, inviting yeah. me. Well, yeah, I'd love to do it again sometime. Um, so with that, uh, we'll, I'll just let everybody know this, this, uh, has been recorded. We'll, we'll get it up here quickly, uh, as quick as I can. And, um, if there's, uh, you know, I'll, I'll try and put together the list of books that you mentioned at the beginning and a, and a couple of references. If you think of something after, uh, you know, it's like, you know, I'd start with the Apocrypha. Is, is that what you'd start with? Like if somebody wanted to to do something a little bit? No, I'd, I'd start with the standard works, you know. Well, I, yeah, would start, obviously, yeah, obviously. I, I would start with the Book of Mormon. I would start with Christ's prophecy, you know, Christ's teachings to the Nephites. That is where it all began, you know, with me. It was, you know, I, I should have you know, brought this up at the beginning, but, you know, I was after I had you know, this horrific experience. I had talked with my um, parents, and you know the scriptures just boring. You know what do what do I need to do? I said, well, you need to ask the Lord what you should be studying. So uh, that's what I did, and the answer was, you need to understand Christ's message to the Nephites, and that changed everything. So if you're looking for some place to start, start there. And then that that's what kind of was the catalyst for you then as. <clears throat> As Absolutely. you were studying, then you went out and the Lord just kind of led you to other things. Yeah, that's exactly Got it. right. Got it. Uh, that's awesome. So again, just be led by the spirit. So uh, a lot of thanks coming in from people. Uh, again, Michael, thank you very much. And uh, we'll go ahead and close this out and uh, just appreciate your time today. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Okay. See you, okay. everybody. See you. Bye.